Welcome to another uh, Facebook Live. Uh, I'm Kyle Kuznose. Um, I'm a fascial counterstrain practitioner and director of the Jones Institute, and I'm here with Brian Tucky, the director of fascial counterstrain. Um, and in our attempts to continue to create more content and engage our student base, uh, we're doing another Facebook Live. Um, we realize that our audience is kind of quite diverse with uh, experienced fascial practitioners, uh, students that are kind of midway through the curriculum and then prospective students. So we're going to try and shoot the content kind of right down the middle for you guys. Uh, the topic that I chose um, today um, is uh, convergence and neurogenic inflammation and how uh, we can target those things with our diagnostics and treatment interventions um, to become powerful treaters of, of chronic pain. Um, so I'll let Brian introduce himself uh, and then we'll go from there. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, Brian Tuckey. I am the developer, if you want to call it that, or the innovator of fascial counterstrain. I am one of only four physical therapists who was ever certified to teach classic strain and counterstrain, its predecessor by Dr. Larry Jones, the osteopathic physician. Um, I used to teach for him back in the 1990s. Back when Dr. Jones passed away, it, it was a technique that had made him world famous. Uh, but it only had about 200 different techniques in the arsenal at that time. And since that time, I've expanded it in both its application, diagnostics, and the number of treatments to well over a thousand different anatomically specific techniques that now allow us to assess and treat virtually every structure in the human body, both peripheral and central nervous system. So I guess we'll start by saying quickly, you know, what, what makes fascial counterstrain unique in the world of manipulation. Uh, first thing is it's, it's indirect. So most of you out there, if, if you've never heard of it, uh, manipulation typically is direct. You find a barrier and you try and work through that barrier. Indirect techniques are proprioceptive in nature. They are non-force techniques and they work by decompressing the tissue and shutting off nociceptors, pain receptors, uh, by draining inflammation away from those tissues which as we'll talk about is really the source of chronic pain. So the beauty is it gets to the source of the problem, which is trapped inflammation. That inflammation goes into the lymphatic system and you eventually pee it out. So it has a fantastic carryover. It works on all tissues and it does not cause pain and cannot hurt anybody because you don't engage barriers. So again, multi-system, peripheral, central, uh, pain-free and lasting. So it has uh, huge benefits and for that reason, it's starting to grow rapidly around the world and its use and uh, obviously application from practitioners. So the, the analogy I love that kind of simplifies the indirect nature of the technique is zipping up your suitcase. That zipper gets stuck. It gets snagged. You can either try and pull real hard and yank through that restriction, which is a direct technique, um, or you go backwards. All right. You can go backwards with the zipper. You can push stuff out of the way, let things line up and then proceed forward again. So with counter strain, it being an indirect technique, we're going backwards into the direction of ease, the direction the body wants to go. And then we allow sort of the pathophysiologic uh, mechanism of the technique to occur in that uh, compressed state. Um, do you want to talk about that at all, Brian? Yeah, I think we'll. Uh... I can get into that a little bit in a couple of the pictures later where I have a couple of demonstrations of how we could deal with some of this central sensitization. Um, <clears throat> but one of the questions we always get at the beginning is if I've not heard of this, you know, why is that? And really the modern version of counterstrain, fascial counterstrain is really only about 15 to 20 years old. And if you look at techniques like acupuncture, chiropractic, they're hundreds, if not thousands of years old. So it's a very new technique. But as I said before, it's now being taught in four different continents, uh, being sought out by professional athletes, all types, of course, chronic pain patients. It was even profiled in Tony Robbins' book, uh, Life Force on Medical Breakthroughs in 2022, which got it lots of international attention because that was a you know, best-selling book internationally. So it's a matter of time before it's pretty much a household uh, technique name, but we wanted to see if we can get uh, a lot of you guys interested in training, because one of the main problems with the technique right now is that there are not enough practitioners. Everyone who does this well is pretty much overbooked and we need more qualified practitioners, okay? So I guess we'll, we'll jump in and Kyle can, you know, keep me on track if uh, we gotta, you know, talk about some things you guys need to know to, to understand the technique more. But um, what we really wanted to touch on first to today is the concept 
of neurogenic inflammation and or convergence. And the reason we wanna talk about this is because in acute pain or subacute pain conditions where the person's been recently injured, you know, local direct techniques can be quite effective. Okay, so sports medicine setting, um, you know, or right after an auto accident, there's soft tissue healing time. But when you get into the world of persistent or chronic pain, soft tissue healing time has elapsed and everyone has already treated locally. So many of the practitioners uh, uh, that are treating pathological chronic pain are gonna find that those local techniques no longer work. And it is because in order to be successful in the treatment of chronic pain, you have to understand the neurology of pain because most of that pain is not local when it doesn't respond to local treatment. And that starts off by understanding two key concepts of the nervous system, which are, as the screen says, neuron convergence and neurogenic inflammation. So before we do that, let me uh, advance here one slide and let you guys know that what we go through tonight is a very small portion of what we cover in the Foundations of Fascial Counterstrain original uh, class that we do, the beginner class. And this is a, public, a published rationale, which is the, the leading chronic pain rationale that is out there today. Um, I've got my picture in the way there, but uh, I was the lead author and it's joined by many of the very well-known chronic pain uh, physicians around the world like Jay Shaw from NIH and John Serberly from the University of Guelph and in Canada. And basically what this particular article does is goes into the uh, reason and why chronic pain is created and can be maintained in the body. And it has to do with dysfunction of the lymphatic system and trapped inflammation. So this is a 145 citation, 6,300 word uh, article hypothesis that will go into way more depth than what we talk about tonight. So this serves as the physiological rationale behind the technique. And again, if you're a practitioner out there, uh, please read this because this will tell you based on the latest physiology, why and how chronic pain exists in the body and will segue great into what we talk about tonight. One more thing before we move on, uh, this particular article has been very well received. It has uh, actually been downloaded more than 98% of all Frontiers Journal articles all time and is the number one most downloaded article in Frontiers of Musculoskeletal Pain all time in, in two years, okay? All right, so let's move on and talk a little bit about the neurology of pain. Let me get this out of the way again. So the first thing we have to understand when we think about pain, or we have to understand that pain is not a one neuron phenomenon. It's a three neuron uh, system or chain. You have your first order neuron, which is receiving the, you know, the insult, the stimulus, the cytokines or the inflammation produced in the body. And these neurons as a group go in and report to what is called a second order neuron, which is a spinal cord neuron inside the spinal cord. Then that neuron, if it's triggered because enough of these neurons have sent in their uh, neurotransmitters causing the second neuron to fire, that then takes the pain signal up to the area of the brain and brain stem where it is processed in the thalamus and then sent on to the higher brain centers where you can say cognitively, what am I gonna do about this pain or even what's the emotional response to the pain? So the first thing again is that pain is actually a three nerve uh, you know, system. So turns out free nerve ending wise, all these guys here, there are over 7 trillion with a T free nerve endings in the body. There cannot be seven trillion second order neurons in your spinal cord, or our spinal cord would be as thick as a tree trunk, where, whereas it's actually about the size you know, of a penny, okay? So what is happening here is a big group of primary pain sensing neurons converge into the second order neurons in the spinal cord. And they send these neurotransmitters, inflammatory chemicals like substance P and, and CGRP um, to that area of that uh, dorsal root ganglia and the dorsal horn. And depending on the levels of those chemicals, that second order neuron may fire, giving you the sensation of pain, okay? So the key thing is there's a big convergence of multiple neurons onto that second spinal cord neuron. So just because you have a tender point, it does not mean you will experience pain. And that's why many times if you're in a class or something or, or you're being treated, 
someone can find a tender point that you're unaware of. Like, wow, I didn't know that hurt. Well, that was a first order neuron reporting, but it wasn't enough of a stimulus to make the second order neuron go up to where you had conscious awareness of that pain. So let's take that one step further. And this is a slide out of our uh, Foundations of Fascial Counterstrain class where we talk about this concept. And to really bring this concept home of convergence and neurogenic inflammation to the student base, I really use the example of a power strip, okay? So what you have here are all these first order neurons bringing in the substance P and this inflammation from the perimeter or from the body and dumping it onto that area of the second neuron in the spinal cord. So there might be activated pain receptors from the skin. There might be muscle fascia reporting. There could be visceral fascia reporting. There could be nerve sheaths that have pain receptors reporting. It could be vessel sheaths that have pain receptors reporting, and they all dump inflammation into that area. The one or ones that are primary actually share inflammation with the other convergent neurons that are not really the source. And that is what is called neurogenic inflammation. So if in the case of the nerve, okay, the cytic nerve is the source of the problem and inflammation, it will dump inflammation into the spinal cord and some inflammation can go back out one or multiple of these and end up in the tissues, but that area was not the source, it was secondary. That inflammation was produced by the nervous system retrograde from the spinal cord back out. So to drive this home, those people who you've seen who have sciatica, or if you've had it yourself, you can see even though the nerve root, let's say at lumbar five is the source, so this would be the source, people end up with all this pain down the side of their leg. It can go into the perineals or, or lateral calf, dorsum of the foot. The skin becomes tender. The muscles become uh, tender and inflamed. And they're actually inflamed because the inflammation travels back out and dumps into those other tissues. And this can be very confusing for patients and practitioners because they're down at the calf where the person says, this is where my pain is, and they feel something. They feel sensitivity, they feel swelling, they feel hypertonicity, and they're like, okay, I'm just gonna dig on this calf, it's gonna fix it. But as you know, in the case of sciatica, that won't work because those are secondary neurogenic areas of inflammation produced by the primary area and dumped into the other tissues via convergence and neurogenic inflammation, okay? Uh, one other thing I'll, I'll throw in here real quick is that it is shown that all spinal neurons that are these deep nociceptive tissues, like the pain receptors in the organ tissue and the nerves and the vessels, they all have a convergent patch of skin. They all have a projected area of inflammation to the skin. And what this is, is what we call in counter strain, the diagnostic tender point. And Dr. Jones and I over, you know, collectively 50 plus years have figured out if this particular structure is inflamed, where is the diagnostic tender point on the surface of the skin? And we can use that for diagnosis and for monitoring the effectiveness of our treatments. So the skin is a secondary area of inflammation or hyperalgesia that is incredibly diagnostic and can allow us to find the primary source of the inflammation and not chase these secondary areas. Do you have anything to add there, Kyle? Yeah, retrograde inflammation was a, a new concept for me uh, a handful of years ago. And so I looked into it at the time and I found um, that that phenomenon is actually utilized in neuroscience. Um, well, they, they will inject uh, compounds that they can trace into peripheral neurons um, and then they follow those neurons via imaging and see where they land. So this concept of pro-inflammatory uh, pro cytokines traveling up and down the neuron, both forward and backward, um, is, is absolutely how um, pain is, is spreading here to, to multiple systems and to multiple areas of, of the body. Um, the other thing, you know, I'd love for you to touch on, you know, clinically, what I think we're all finding is not all convergence seems equal. Um, in that there are definitely high priority vertebral segments or areas of, of neural tissue um, that are common and seem to come up over and over and over again. So we've talked about like OA junction, C1, T1, T2, C7, or T7, T8. Um, talk a little bit about 
about those and, and maybe why those areas are, are as important as they are? Yeah, so I'll give you one example that I, I use every day in my particular caseload. So I've designed my caseload to help further the technique that I take pretty much 100% fail cases. What I mean by that, uh, patients have had the symptoms for years, they've seen multiple practitioners, over half my caseload flies in for treatment and stays several days. Uh, and I treat them an hour and a half, three days in a row, typically, and then that's it. You know, because the technique, you know, it doesn't need to be done ongoing. It, it, it drains the inflammation, it works. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody is cured and, it, and nobody needs to come back for another round, but that is the general course. And, you know, many people do not need to return. Um, but it's allowed me to really identify, again, the pathophysiology behind these very difficult cases. And, and an example, uh, that you can, uh, that, you know, segues into what Kyle said is, for example, the T1, T2 level. And you'll see that many of your patients with head symptoms, you know, post-concussion syndromes, uh, you know, chronic conditions as far as migraine headaches, uh, pressure headaches, tinnitus, you know, all these, uh, you know, various congestive syndromes almost, the neurovascular symptoms of the head have a T1, 2 problem. And that is because the preganglionic sympathetic neurons that go to all the vessels of the head originate at T1 and T2. So any structure of T1, 2 dumps inflammation into T1, 2 spinal cord, and it will stimulate the sympathetic nerves that go into the head, causing vasoconstriction, migraines, pressure, uh, you know, post-concussion syndrome, things like that, that, that cannot be treated through the head without fixing this sympathetic drive that controls vascular tone. Uh, trigeminal, C1, C2, C3. The trigeminal nerve causes vasodilation of arteries, but blocks drainage in the brain. So C1, C2, C3 will cause all types of, of headache and migraine problems because of the spinal trigeminal nucleus, where C1, C2, C3 go into trigeminal nerve, and that particular cranial nerve controls the blood supply in the head as well. Uh, so people with you know, short-term memory problems, you know, early dementia, you know, uh, weird disequilibrium, vertigo, so many cases that can actually be treated using the concepts of convergence through the neck. You don't even have to have brain stem and brain skills. So what, you know, like obviously with counter we have our diagnostic tender points and our different diagnostic assessments, but if I did not have those skills, what might I find in someone who, you know, has essentially sensitized and has um, some of these convergence problems? Um, if I were to assess their cervical science, uh, cervical spine, what would I find? Yes. So, so what I would say, even if you're not going to use this methodology, or you're using, you know, the skills you have, muscle energy, uh, joint mobilization, you know, my fascial release, uh, visceral manipulation, whatever you have, is that pay attention to the fact that the chronic pain is going to have a spinal component. And it could be an autonomic component from that T1 to L2 area. It could be a somatic component, which of course could be the C1 all the way down into the coccyx. So if you have a person who's not responding, and let's say it's an elbow, and you're like, okay, everyone's treated the elbow and the elbow treatment didn't work. Go back into the cervical, lower cervicals and upper thoracic, looking at the neurological feed to the elbow, to the vessels of the arm um, and look for your areas of restriction and use the technique that you know on those spinal segments, calm that local neurology, okay? And there are some assessments that we use besides the tender point in fascial counterstrain. Uh, one is called the cranial scan is something I developed that we won't get into, but it's is extremely powerful. It really puts you right where you need to be. But another one is, is, is something called touch inhibition, where if you go to an area of inflamed activated pain receptors and you put light touch pressure on it, stimulating mechanoreceptors, you will gate the muscle guarding reflexes that are associated with that patch of inflammation. So for example, if you're like, boy, I think this elbow might be related to this lower neck problem. You can gently pressure the lower neck. And if you feel the elbow tissue soften and relax, it is coming from the neck. It's literally that, that simple. Uh, motion testing skills, we teach you how to do that. But what we're trying to say is you understand the, the, the pathophysiology, the neurology behind pain. And then we have various assessments that allow you to verify the source of the pain, not just segment, but also structure. You know, Is this a vascular problem? Is this a neural problem? Is this a visceral problem? And where is it projecting? So what would you say the, the difference is then between a practitioner that has a multi-system approach and, and one that doesn't in treating uh, some of these issues? Well, I think in, a, in like a sports medicine world or maybe an acute orthopedic office, uh, you might see 
you know, of your pain caseload might be musculoskeletal. But when you get into the world of chronic pain, where most of us live, who do this for, for a living, um, the pure muscle cases are probably less than 1%. Um, muscles involved in maybe 15%, 20%, but the vast majority of chronic pain patients need another type of nociceptor, at least in addition to the musculoskeletal system treated. And when I say musculoskeletal system, um, you know, we're talking myofascia, which most people treat, but musculoskeletal nociceptors include ligament, cartilage, bone, periosteum, capsules, all of that. So, you know, maybe 20, 25%, 30% collectively in that world, but without getting into the viscera, the vasculature, the mesentery, the neurology, um, the spinal cord structures, chronic pain is very hard to treat. And so um, your next kind of points on the PowerPoint, the dorsal root reflexes, um, how does that play into this? So again, not to get too deep into it, but basically dorsal root reflexes, which were discovered in 1990, um, are part of this retrograde inflammation. So this is the uh, cell body of that, you know, first order neuron. And, and when the inflammation comes into that, and there are multiple neurons in one spinal nerve, um, again, it, it sends out retrograde from the dorsal root ganglion but it also happens at the spinal cord level as well. So there's really two places, the dorsal root ganglia and the dorsal horn, where you can get this neurogenic production of inflammation. Um, moving on, what some of the things that we wanna, we've already touched on, but you have to understand that when these pain receptors project and dump their cytokines and neurotransmitters into the dorsal horn, it stimulates reflexes. And there are two main reflexes that pain receptors stimulate, which we see clinically. One are muscle guarding reflexes. So every time you have a stimulated nociceptor to a certain extent, there is a certain muscle in the area that will guard and unload and immobilize that tissue. So what that means is, just as you see in this particular uh, slide here, you may have the fascia overlying the liver. So in the case of like the triangular ligament of the liver, if those nociceptors are firing, it'll go into the ventral horn and you're gonna get a corresponding muscle guarding. In the case of the liver, you often see the intercostals or the diaphragm spasms, okay? So as a myotherapist, you would say, wow, you've got a diaphragm, diaphragm problem. Well, in this case, it's not the muscle fascia that is driving it. It's not the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a protector. It is the visceral ligament that is the inflamed structure. So what happens is you go digging on this diaphragm. It hurts a lot, but it comes right back. If you then go in and you have the skill to assess and treat the visceral ligaments, the triangular ligaments, uh, coronary ligaments that are suspend that uh, visceral technique and drain the inflammation off of this nociceptive source, this muscle guarding disappears because it's called in by a reflex arc, okay? So that's the first thing you have to understand, muscle guarding reflexes exist. Other examples that you see all day, uh, a straight leg raise, okay? So if you have a sciatic nerve, irritated nerve, the hamstrings protect it. You can't stretch through that. It's not a hamstring problem. Hamstrings, when they're dysfunctional, you get a bent knee. When you get a limited straight leg raise, that's a nerve protection, low back protection, uh, you know, hamstring guarding a nerve problem or a back problem. When you get an inflamed nerve, like in the brachial plexus, if you inflame the nerve roots of your neck, you'll see the trapezius becomes tight. It's guarding and protecting those nerve roots. It doesn't want them to stretch. And if you don't know that, you'll go to the tender, tense upper trapezius and you'll say, oh boy, this is an upper trapezius. This is a levator scap. No, that is the secondary muscle guarding reflex, which will also be tender because of neurogenic inflammation. So okay. in, in the example here with the, with the liver and the, and the diaphragm, why is it that the liver doesn't reduce the amount of inflammation uh, in its tissues itself and kind of shut down this mechanism before it? Uh, kind of transitions from an acute into chronic problem? So the answer to that is what is detailed in the article, okay? And again, there's a, a, something we go into a lot in the class and the article details it, that there exists in the body certain cytokines that when they're produced at certain levels and, and the main ones are interleukin 1b, interleukin 6, and TNF, tumor necrosis factor alpha, when those are produced by traumas, infection, inflammation, surgery, they make collagen fibroblast cells produce another chemical, if there's enough inflammation, called TGF beta-1. And that transforming growth factor beta-1 happens to make fascia contract. 
So when enough injury, enough inflammation occurs, TGF beta one causes a trans uh, transference or a mutation or you know transformation of fibroblasts into myofibroblasts, contractile version. They produce this chemical. They contract after they differentiate, and it blocks the drainage. So what you end up having is inflammation causes contraction, contraction blocks the drainage, and it creates an area of stasis. And that is what the article talks about, interstitial inflammatory stasis. That is a group of chemical cytokines that stimulate the pain receptors ongoing. So, and again, there's lots and lots of research. This has even been sampled, uh, this interstitial stasis, these cytokines. Um, again, it, it is the only article currently and the only thesis that, that has not been discredited out there on chronic pain. Um, you, can, you can sample this inflammation, you can image it with ultrasound, and we drain it out for a living for 30 years. But it is an area of trapped inflammation in specific tissues that's driving it. So if we could go back to convergence uh, for a second and into these like high volume spinal segments or, or areas of uh, neural tissue of, of convergence, Give us like your top 10 areas um, in chronic pain patients. Let's just say like vertebral segments that you would, that you would think uh, to, to assess. Yeah, so, so C1, COC1, C1, C2, C3, T1, T2, C7, T1, because of, of the dura association of the nuchal ligament up into the dura, coccyx, okay, because of the attachment of the phylum terminale, L1-2, because of the termination at, at the uh, end of the spinal cord is at that level and all your neurons come out of there. And then obviously the L5-S1 is also pretty important, you know, mechanically. So those would be about 10 segments that are unduly powerful. Um, let's see. Um, can I, let me go through one more thing real quick, Kyle. And if you have a couple of questions, yeah, I'll be more than happy. Um, one more thing you have to understand that is created when the nociceptors fire. So you get muscle guarding reflexes, but you also get smooth muscle contraction due to what is called sympathetic activation. So it turns out that these same nociceptive neurons, and we'll use our triangular ligament of the inflamed triangular ligament of the liver example. It also goes in to the intermedial lateral column, which is the autonomic area of the spinal cord and causes sympathetic nerve activation or SNA. And what sympathetic nerve activation does at that level of the spine causes vasoconstriction, chronic vasoconstriction. So the veins constrict, which can cause chronic edema and, and large scope, and the arteries constrict, which can cause poor nutrition to an area, which can cause breakdown, tendinopathy, degeneration, trophic changes over time. So this is a, an explanation of why you see people who maybe hurt their knee in, in high school, sprained a knee toward the meniscus, and when they're 55, they're 60, they're you're good to be my age, that is the knee that it has degenerated. And they're like, well, you know, it, it, it felt better. I did hurt this way back in, in high school. Well, it turns out you created some level of vasoconstriction from the ligaments of the knee. No one ever assessed and treated those vessels, and you get premature degenerative changes in that area years later, osteoarthritis, wear and tear. It's not just from rubbing. It is at very specific places and it is related to this phenomenon, which is sympathetic activation or vasoconstriction. So this also explains, and we can talk about this stuff, you know, for uh, 14 classes, okay. but this also explains what you see in fibromyalgia patients. Again, pressure headaches, migraines, vasoconstriction, uh, poor digestion, peristalsis, vasoconstriction, you know, constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, um, you know, vertigo, POTS, you know, all these syndromes that are vascular and, and unknown, idiopathic, same reflex arc. So counter strainers live in the world of unknown pain and idiopathic conditions. And again, that was the title of the article, okay? Idiopathic visceral and vascular syndromes and chronic pain, because this entire reflex arc affects vessels, muscles, and the pain receptors, okay, which, which then, of course, feeds into the organs as well. And it gets you out of the musculoskeletal world and, and into affecting these other systems of the body, which really dictate how the body functions, including healing of peripheral uh, injuries, too. Um, and that's the part that I love about the technique is it's not just the knee. It's the abdominal contents and the autonomic nervous system that impacts how the knee really heals. Um, without addressing those things, 
your knee patients can more easily kind of transition from an acute patient into a chronic patient. Um, go ahead. Yeah, and again, as you, as you mentioned there, don't get the impression that these techniques can only be used in the chronic situation. They're fantastic for things like sports medicine. You can drain the swelling out, you can restore the mobility, you can re restore the perfusion, that's the medical word, the artery and venous flow. So artery in, venous out, you can reset that in the first 48, 48, 48 hours, three days of the injury and just unlock it, drop the pain down, drain out the edema and bring in the blood flow to heal it. And facilitate healing right away. 100%, 100%. So if I'm a practitioner interested in, in learning more, um, how, where do I learn more? Uh, let, let me uh, hit a couple more slides here real quick, Cough. Yeah, go ahead. Time. Okay, yeah. So um, the idea that we can affect vessels, you know, for some people that might be on the feed, they're like, that, that sounds kind of crazy. But we have many, many case studies, and this is one that we go over in our venous and lymphatic class. And those of you who are practitioners in the lymphatic world, you'll recognize this really severe bruising and edema as the right upper lymphatic upper quarter watershed. And it's a classic you know, drainage pattern. And this particular lady had a fall onto her, her elbow and shoulder on Christmas Eve and had a mild fracture of the, you know, right below the uh, greater tuberosity of the humeral neck and had a massive stasis situation and swelling situation following. Uh, which tells me, by the way, that she had pre-existing lymphatic drainage issues here before she fell. And this, as you can see in the caption, this is nine days after the fall. And her husband took this picture before sending her into one of our fascial counter strain practitioners. So this is what the body was able to do in a state of sympathetic activation and vasospasm over nine days. The next picture you're going to see is after uh, two days after treatment, okay? The body, once you relieve the vasospasm, what the body can do in two days. And by the way, the therapist that treated her uh, first sent me this picture and said, Brian, would you treat this patient? I said, did she have a Doppler? And he said, yes, it was normal. I said, yes, go ahead. And he, she came in an 11 out of 10 pain, Ham was shaking, and he ran out of time after treating vessels and, and and some soft tissues in general, he got right to here and ran out of time, um, ran out of time for the, for the visit. So he did, did not treat past the elbow. So pay attention to this next picture. You can see where the counter strain stopped. And this is the after picture. And this again is two days later with the addition of fascial counter strain and the vasculature doing what it normally could do. And you can see exactly where he left his treatment off. Uh, this area with the radial and ulnar veins did not drain hardly at all. And this part, the body was able to take even all those protein uh, areas in the lymphatic system, picked up all those dead blood cells, et cetera, okay? So again, that's vascular treatment, and that is the rapid nature uh, of the healing if the body is working properly. And then one of the things I wanted to touch on, again, since we're talking a little bit about this idea of spinal cord inflammation, is that if the inflammation becomes great enough, it goes into what is a state, is called central sensitization. And that means the inflammation produced dumps into that area to an extent to where the glial cells in the spinal cord, which are the immune cells of the spinal cord, react and start to produce their own inflammation. It causes like an immune reaction in the spinal cord. And this can cause massive amounts of inflammation that can spread up and down the entire area of the spinal cord. And it causes central sensitization and that inflammation can get trapped in there just like the periphery. So what we uh, can do as a counterstrain practitioner is, is target the drainage pathways of the spinal cord to help patients with central sensitization who might have pain all over the body. And I wrote down a couple you know, signs that your patient has spinal cord or some of this central sensitization inflammation. Uh, first of all, it doesn't respond to local treatment, okay? Pain is often bilateral, it spreads to both sides. So both my hips hurt, both my feet hurt, both my shoulders hurt. Uh, it's pain that can migrate day to day. They'll say some days my feet hurt more, some days my thighs hurt more, some days my back hurts more. That's migratory. That's not a pathological local pain. The pain is much more generalized than it is specific. So if a person says my entire knee just throbs, okay, that's often one of these neurogenic pain versus if they say it's right here on the joint line on the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, which is much more likely local. And then again, with these inflammatory multi-system syndromes, you also get associated other symptoms from this convergence. 
like cramping, digestion problems, heart issues, breathing, urination, bowel issues, constipation. Um, and then if it's the brainstem that's inflamed, upper cervical, upper thoracic, you can get things because of like inflammation in the brainstem, hypothalamus, sleep disturbance, anxiety, memory problems, brain fog, headaches, TMJ, vision, balance. So this is inflammation in the nervous system. And if you look at one of these patients, you can't treat them with exercise for 65 different conditions and send them to the Euro guy and send them to the GI guy. You have to say, what, is, what does all of this neurology, where is it all have in common? Is this the upper cervical brainstem? Is this you know, the lumbar five level? Is this the lumbar one level that could affect all the pelvic and then target that area of inflammation? So I've been at, um, at CSM the last couple of years and it was actually here in San Diego last year. It's the big national physical therapy conference and uh, made a point to go to all of the pain science and, and neuroscience lectures uh, that I could. And I feel like I noticed this last year more than 10 years ago, um, central sensitization really being talked about as a pain mechanism. Um, but the problem that I found at the conference is that no one was really offering a solution for dealing with patients that are centrally sensitized. Um, so FCS, fascial counterstrain, is offering that in, you know, expand on that just a little bit more. I know you just mentioned it in some ways, but. Yeah, so so again, you know, trying to take much more of your time here, guys, but we'll, we'll just say, let's, let's, what could we possibly do if we realize that the person has inflammation at the spinal cord level? And we know that all those various neurons are being excited. How can we target that inflammation now that we understand where it's coming from. And what I have uh, here, for example, is two pictures that talk about the lymphatics and the veins of the epidural system, even the spinal cord. So again, you can get this sympathetic activation, vasoconstriction of this area of the body, okay? So it doesn't just happen in the peripheral tissues. So areas of inflammation around the ligaments of the spine and, and all types of areas, the vessel nociceptors can create vasoconstriction at the spine level and really block this inflammation. And this particular picture here shows that they've actually now discovered lymphatics in the spinal canal area, which again, that's something that you know wasn't there. This is 2019 research. So there are lymphatics and veins that can congest and contract and become dysfunctional, trapping inflammation at the spinal cord. So we would go through the assessment process of fascial counterstrain using our assessments, and it will tell us you have a problem of the epidural venous drainage system or the spinal vein venous drainage system, and then we apply our techniques. And these three techniques I'm gonna show you are actually three techniques for spinal cord inflammation that are taught in the, in the foundations class, in the first class. So in this case, we would diagnose this person as having epidural vein you know, stasis and uh, vasoconstriction. Uh, from say L2 to L5. And we have one technique that works for any of that area of stasis. And the tender points that would diagnose this are on the lateral aspects of the femur in the exact area shown about mid femur, L2, L3, L4, and L5 right here. Now, many of you recognize that area as a TFL foam rolling area. And people foam roll this area over and over and over again. And as you know, it just hurts every day. And it generally comes right back because it is actually neurogenic inflammation onto that tissue from the lumbar segments that are inflamed. So what we do as counter strainers, and all these techniques are mapped out, we do a little lower trunk rotation, opening up that foramen, and we fine tune this position to where this sensitivity drops, and then we lean back and traction and drain the inflammation from the back through the leg while monitoring the di diagnostic tender point. I like to call this traction with a plan. So you actually have diagnostic tender points that related to convergence will disappear when we've drained the deep vein stasis. So we actually can monitor the fact that we have in fact fixed that deep vein stasis, even though we can't see it. You can go back to the spine then and feel the mobility and it will be markedly improved and way less sensitive in the spine itself. And then you will have fixed the source of this chronic TFL lateral leg pain. Of course, lumbar radiculopathy, degenerative back, so many things that you could use this simple technique for. Another one, what about the neck? If a person has a cervical area of venous stasis, cervical radiculopathy, DJD, disc herniation, chronic pain, doesn't want to move, very rigid, you can do, again, traction with a plan. Flexion, side bent away, rotate toward with traction, 
and the C2, C3, C4, C5, C6 venous plexus locations project right here to the lateral humerus. You can feel this little gristle of fascia when you use this technique. Again, it disappears over about 45 seconds and you've taken care of that venous stasis just like that arm picture, but deep inside the cord. Then the person's inflammation centrally drops down. Maybe that tennis elbow that had neurogenic inflammation from C6, C7 also goes away because you've gotten to the source of the nerve root and not chase the pain at the elbow, okay? The ultrasound friction massage exercises didn't work for two years, then move on. Where's this coming from? Could be the nerve roots. Last but not least, another technique we teach in, in the beginner class, super powerful, is the epidural of C1. It has a very unique tender point right above the medial arch of C1. Obviously, this is an area you feel uh, tightness in that area of that uh, you know, superior nuchal line, greater occipital neuralgia, but it is a drainage tender point that you can manage for the basilar venous plexus. This drains inflammation off the brainstem. This can help things like intention tremors, you know, pressure headaches, uh, cephalgia, you know, all types of brainstem issues, medulla, pons, TMJ, headaches, a tremendously powerful technique that can drain swelling out of the brainstem. So again, this is just techniques, assessment, technique, tender point to monitor the effectiveness, reassess, uh, and that, that is just three examples of, of what are, you know, hundreds of techniques that you can learn in the first two or three classes that you could use every day. So we, we've mentioned fascial foundations a, a couple of times now. It is the uh, kind of gateway course into this fascial uh, multi-system world that Brian, Brian has de uh, developed. Uh, let's talk about that, that course here just quickly. What other techniques um, or systems um, are uh, taught in that course? So in, in foundations, uh, you know, some people they'll say to us and, and we kind of laugh, they're like, you know, can I test out of it? They're like, no, there's a, not a thing you're going to learn here that uh, you've learned in school. Um, we're going to go through the article and the real pathophysiology of, of pain multi-system that we've just touched on tonight. Then we're going to go through lots of lots of videos and, and how you can apply the technique to really understand what it does in the real world. And after you've learned uh, the physiology, then we go into the, the assessment. We start teaching you the assessments, go through some of the base assessments for five different systems. And uh, what we're going to go through, we'll teach you how to use it in the musculoskeletal system, spinal ligaments. We'll teach you how to use it in parts of the sympathetic nervous system to turn down fight or flight and help that vasoconstriction. We'll teach you how to use it in the venous and lymphatic spinal drainage system, like you just saw. We'll teach you how to use it in, in some major locations of the artery system to bring blood supply into the nerve roots and, and help feed tissues in the spine. And then last but not least, the viscera. We'll teach you how to use indirect counter strain for the visceral fascia. Um, and you get about 40, 45 techniques and assessments for those techniques, plus the physiology um, all in the first class. So you leave that first class with a new understanding of modern pathophysiology, chronic pain, and techniques that allow you to treat in systems you very likely have never treated before. You had had one question come in. Um, how quickly can uh, students start treating patients with this uh, with these techniques? Monday after the course ends on Sunday. And that's the goal, right? I mean, that's the emphasis of every course is uh, giving you guys techniques that are clinically applicable on Monday as soon as you get back into your clinic. Yeah, and let me just say this: this is something I understand that a multi-course curriculum can be daunting, but we have a suggested. Uh, curriculum, you know, four, five, six classes that that you go through, which you can get through, you know, in a year and a half, no problem. And that would allow you to treat pretty much everything the average therapist treats. But if you want to get into the world of treating things that nobody else treats, then you have to get into learning about systems and how to treat the brainstem and how to treat the viscera and how to treat the mesentery and how to treat spinal, you know, uh, sulcal veins and arteries and things nobody else treats. So if you want to take your worst Ellers Danlos Potts, you know, patient who's seen 25 practitioners and um, nobody can help them, you're going to need to go to the higher levels of the curriculum. But in a few classes, you can fix most of the things you'll see on this slide here um, with just a few of the classes because, you know, we'll teach you how to treat, you know, labrums of cartilage and how to treat adhesive capsulitis, all the basic, you know, digestive disorders with the viscera, you know, some of the root causes of fibromyalgia, migraines. You can do a lot of these basic techniques in one, in one class.
But now if you want to get into things that are much more complex, like postural ortho orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, you need to learn how to treat up in the area medulla, okay, or, or some Parkinson's disease, where we need to treat in the areas of the substantia nigra and the basal ganglia. These are much more complex things. So people are like, well, gosh, I can't take, you know, 12 classes. No, that's, that's what you look to take over your lifetime. You get through three, four, five classes, and you're doing stuff that you were not even dreaming of two years before, and you're rolling in the basic caseload. And so the, the foundations class is taught two to three times a year, every year, um, but we do have one more uh, course date coming up this year, October 20th through 22nd. Um, that'll be our last, our last foundations of the year. Um, our model, our distribution model has changed a little bit since, since COVID and, and we're mm -hmm. utilizing a, a satellite model now via Zoom. So Brian will be teaching live out of his clinic in Frederick. Um, we'll have a satellite here in San Diego and then one up in the Northwest um, as well. So. Um, that's where uh, that's where those courses will be um, to finish this year off. Really, Can't, this teaching season is almost done. Um, the other thing that I, I just want to mention, because um, I, I know a lot of um, prospective patients have also been watching these. I've been mean, reaching out to our practitioners uh, around the country. You can find um, databases or, or search for practitioners on both the uh, GI Counterstring website and the Counterstring.com website, and Brio will link. Uh, we'll link both of those um, in the comments. Um, anything else you want to say to, to kind of finish up here, Brian? Yeah, I, I just want to say that, uh, you know, we could, we could put many practitioners and many patients on the screen here and, and let them really tell you the impact this technique has had on, on their profession, their lives. But what I want, I want you to understand is that this is the next paradigm. Okay, this research, please read that article. If you're contemplating coming here, go to these websites and, and listen to real practitioners and real patients. Um, you know, don't train in legacy techniques. Don't train in techniques that are 100 years old. Train in the next generation, okay? So even, even in the world of counter-strain, some people say, well, I've done some counter-strain. Um, you know, again, that, that was one assessment. We have five now that we use, and it was 200 points, and we have over 1,200. So, you know, even if you were using counter-strain, this is an exponentially more powerful technique than, than, you know, you were using before. And again, it's indirect. So it's, it's super gentle. You can use it with babies and children. Um, you can use it with people that are fragile. It doesn't hurt. You can use it, you know, on, on anyone that comes in and it's multi-system. It comes with its own assessment um, and the power and the carryover is really unparalleled. I started training in, as a manual therapist uh, at 22 and was in Michigan State training and went through, you know, Stanley Paris's curriculum, did pretty much everything out there. Travel, uh, trained with Butler, LV, all these people. I'm 55 years old today, 33 years of this. And I, you know, I quickly gave up on direct techniques and just, you know, God's grace met Dr. Jones because the carryover wasn't there. I, I helped some people, but I just found myself treating the same things over and over again. I was burning out. I didn't understand why these muscles wouldn't go away. And you can come into this curriculum today and, and be where other therapists who are 25, 30 years out, you'll be there in a year and a half, okay? I've got people working at my clinic, like this massage therapist, Alec. Uh, he started two years ago, has gone through the entire curriculum and is treating all the way into the brain. And he's a massage therapist. And in two years, he is a world-class practitioner who is helping people with strokes and, and all types of things that most patients, you know, most therapists wouldn't even take on as a case. So again, don't train in the old, train in the new, go into the next generation. And Kyle can tell you how many, how many almost retired therapists that we have training that are seventies. And, and they're like, they're like this, I wish this was here all, all my life. I'm having a blast. We've got people that are still, still practicing with us, taking every class that are 75, 80. They just love, love the work because it's what they were always looking for their whole career. I will say too that the technique seems to uh, just grab you and take you for a ride. Like I, uh, when I first started taking courses, I imagined like this train coming by me and me just grabbing on and then off I was. Um, and it really, it creates your practice for you uh, because you become so effective at treating patients that no one else is fixing that word of mouth grows, uh, your practice grows. And then eventually patients are coming to you only for counter strength. Um, if I tried to do anything else at this point, uh, the patients wouldn't be happy. Um, so it, it really is a, it's a practice grower. Um, and, and we could talk about it all day, but um, I think that 
that was a ton of information. Um, again, I love the conversion stock because it's becoming such an important diagnostic piece. Um, as we add more diagnostic assessments to the um, paradigm and, and the workflow, um, but super, super powerful. If you can target areas of convergence um, with not only assessment, but then with intervention too, to help patients that no one else is helping. Um, yeah, and, and the entire curriculum, what it, what it does do, it puts science, anatomy, and structure into osteo osteopathic medicine. So, you know, back in the day, AT still and, and a lot of these famous osteopaths, they were treating multiple systems and tissues, but they were just gifted people with gifted hands and they were just following their hands and, and they got results that no one else could get. But this curriculum is designed for, you know, using Alec, massage therapist, you know, works next to me every day. As an example, you know, Alec is a world-class person who can get results that very few people in the world can get. And he just followed the structure, just does the assessment, understands the anatomy now, and the body will tell you what you need to do if you go through the process. And you have a tool that can work on inflammation anywhere in the body, okay? So again, we hope to see you there sometime. Again, we need more of us. Uh, there's only so many people you can treat per day. And uh, we really look forward to uh, you know seeing you in the foundations class. And you can talk to us. Kyle does a lot of the satellites out in California and I'm in Frederick, Maryland, and we've got people in the Midwest and we run about three, four, five locations uh, for all our foundation classes. So, you know, hopefully you don't have to travel too far to get started. Love it. Well, thank you, Brian, for sharing all your knowledge with us, with us and, and thank you to everyone joining us on, on Facebook. We look forward to seeing you guys soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brian. Okay.